Good morning. Welcome to Selkirk United Church Online. I'm Cole, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. Wherever you are today, know that you are gathered in spirit with the rest of our community of faith, which I understand now stretches from Selkirk to Winnipeg, to Beausager, to Cloverdale, to Brandon, to Michigan, to South Korea, to North Carolina, to England and British Columbia, and who knows where else. But we are together here in this moment in spirit and in love. So welcome, and thank you for being part of our worship service today. Selkirk United is an affirming, inclusive, and welcoming community of faith, where we seek God's guidance in helping us become the people we were created to be. We also acknowledge that we worship on Treaty One land within the homeland of the Métis Nation. We begin our service today by lighting the Christ candle and the rainbow candle. Our first hymn is number 574 in Voices United, Come, let us sing of a wonderful love. you to bow your heads for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, draw us from the many places we come from into your presence this morning. We bring a mosaic of experiences as broad as your world, yet what we hold in common, our faith in you, is stronger than any other force. Increase our faith that it may unite us in heart and soul and voice and action. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For announcements today, I wanted to share with you that I was interviewed by someone from the Selkirk Record this past week about what our church is doing for online services and how we are finding new ways to be the church during this pandemic. 
I'm not sure how much of the interview will make it into the paper, and I'm not sure which edition it will be in, but you can be on the lookout for that article coming fairly soon, probably within the next week or two. Today would normally be birthday box day in our church. For those who don't know what that's all about, once a month during the announcement time, I wander through the congregation with a microphone and a lovely little decorated shoe box with birthday box written on the outside, and people who have had a birthday or an anniversary during that month stand up and tell everyone what they're celebrating. And we say happy birthday or happy anniversary or whatever the case may be. And then they make a special donation to the church. Often the donation matches whatever year they're celebrating, like maybe $40 if they're turning 40 or $15 if they're celebrating their 15th anniversary or a loony if they have a grandchild turning one. And 10% of all of those donations go to the Mission and Service Fund each month. Obviously, I'm not able to walk around the sanctuary with the actual birthday box today, but I would like to say happy birthday and happy anniversary to all of you who have been celebrating those special days this past month. Actually, we missed March's birthday box too, so all of you who celebrated in March or April, congratulations. Oh, and also a special thank you to those who have continued to find ways to make donations to the church during this time. I know that at least one of those donations was for the birthday box a week or two ago. Thank you so much for your generosity during this difficult time. And the last announcement that I have for today is one about our prayer shawl ministry. We are going to be blessing the prayer shawls in just a moment, but before we do that, I also wanted to mention that one of our congregation members came up with the wonderful idea that perhaps we could send some prayer shawls to Nova Scotia to the United Church that is located in one of the towns where that terrible tragedy unfolded over a week ago now. We've sent out a pastoral letter with the offer of some prayer shawls and we're just waiting to hear back, but we're hopeful that we can send some of our shawls as a small gesture to help those people and communities as they seek healing in the days and weeks to come. If you have other announcements that you'd like to share with everyone, just send them in and we'll share them either in the midweek message or next Sunday. We have a prayer shawl ministry at our church at Selkirk United, and uh, that means that uh, we have a number of people who knit beautiful prayer shawls, and then we offer them to the, anyone who needs one. And it's a ministry of the whole church, so anyone who knows someone who needs a prayer shawl can come and select one and pick one out and uh, offer it to, to whoever it is in their lives that, uh, that needs a warm embrace and God's hope and God's peace and God's healing love. I'd like to offer a blessing of the prayer shawls now. I invite you to pray. God of creation, God of compassion, God of sustaining grace, we praise you for the opportunity to take part in this ministry so that we might see a world beyond our small corner. We thank you for putting those in need on our hearts and in our minds so that we might fully live out your call to love and serve. We ask that you bless these shawls those who have knit them together with love, and those who will receive them. May they feel the love, comfort, and peace of your presence. May they feel the warm embrace of your love for them, and the healing and peace that you intend for us. And may your light shine in them and be a beacon of the hope that is promised to us all. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. In the very beginning, before anything was, before God started doing what it is God does, when all that existed was wide open space, God imagined a universe and began to create. Our planet God made a blue and green sphere and designed it to orbit the sun once a year. God made tropics and plateaus, glaciers and meadows, marshes and tundras and erupting volcanoes. Then, with gardens and forests and other things green, God made earth come to life using soil and seed. God made cypress and pines, bushes and vines, all kinds of trees with leaves God designed. Then the oceans God filled with fish, sharks and krill, creatures God made with fins and with gills. God planned lions to roar and tigers to pounce 
and kangaroos God thought, let's make you bounce. And God made people like you and me, people with souls, people with stories, a global family tree. But always remember, because this much is true, God had a purpose for making you, you. So use every gift, every talent or shtick, make the world better with your God-given trick. Save a whale, hug a tree, protect every bee, recycle, repurpose, reject apathy. Because all of creation whispers God's story, the mountain, the ocean, the blue morning glory. And just like a star might showcase God's light, or a waterfall gives us a sign of God's might, the same could be said of me and of you, how we live, how we love, and tell God's story too. Because when God made the world, and the world starts spinning, the story God wrote was just a beginning. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and the fourth Sunday of Easter is often called Good Shepherd Sunday, and we often read or hear the 23rd Psalm on this particular Sunday. We're going to hear that or uh, actually see it in a, in a different kind of way. It's going to be offered by uh, Samantha Beach Kiley, who put this together for a church down in Austin, Texas, and the music's by Caleb J. Murphy. So I want you to uh, enjoy this version of the 23rd Psalm. And then the second reading will be a reading from the book of Acts, read by our own Pat Byrne.
Good morning, everyone. The first scripture reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 14a and verses 36 to 41. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. If you had told me a few months ago that within eight to ten weeks we would triple or even quadruple our attendance at church, I would have said, mm, I don't think so. I would have doubted that very much. Yet, here we are, just a few weeks removed from worshipping as usual in our church sanctuary, with somewhere around a hundred people gathered each Sunday, to broadcasting our service on YouTube with an average attendance of over 300 households. It's hard to believe how much has changed in just a few short weeks. The title of the sermon is meant to be sarcastic, by the way. The title is, That Was Easy. In fact, nothing about these past two months has been remotely easy. Oh, for some people it has been more of an inconvenience than anything. But for many other people it has been a matter of life and death. It has meant losing a job or losing a significant percentage of their income. For others, it has meant illness, death, grieving. For others, it has meant putting themselves at risk every day as they continue to go to work in potentially unsafe conditions. And for others, it has meant isolation, loneliness, depression, and worrying about family members who are at risk. For so many people, it has not been an easy transition at all to this new normal that we find ourselves facing. I'm sure you could see that sense of distress and grief and fear portrayed very well in the video of the 23rd Psalm that you saw a few moments ago. We are all feeling some of those same feelings these days, and it's not easy. I should mention that as I record this sermon, the announcement has been made here in Manitoba that the process of easing some of the restrictions will begin this coming week. And similar announcements are being made in other provinces and states and countries as well in different ways. But I think we all know that this is going to be a slow process, that everything will not just get back to normal quickly, if ever, and that for many people their lives will be forever changed. We also have no idea what is going to happen next or whether any of our plans will work. So it is still a frightening time. And yet we carry on as best we can, trying to be safe, trying to listen to the experts, trying to be positive, trying to have faith that there are so many good people out there making a difference, offering themselves to others, working for good in this strange reality. And there is much to be hopeful about and much to be thankful for, even in the midst of crisis. I came up with that sermon title, when I was reading this morning's second scripture reading, the one from the book of Acts. When I first read about how the early church added, what was it, 3,000 members all at once, just like that, well, it sounded amazing. And really, fairly easy. I mean, Peter gets up in front of a huge crowd of people in Jerusalem and he tells them about Jesus, and the next verse says that 3,000 people joined the flock that day. That was easy. But it wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't easy for Jesus. He was put to death for being the kind of radical leader he was. And it wasn't easy for the apostles either. They were afraid to leave their upper room, 
probably afraid that what happened to Jesus would happen to them. And they might have stayed there, locked up and hidden away, if it wasn't for Jesus reappearing to them after the resurrection, giving them the courage and the strength they needed to go and tell the world this good news. It wasn't easy. But whatever happened that day in Jerusalem, in that story we heard from Acts, it sure was effective. Why do you suppose that so many people were moved that day, so moved? It must have been more than just Peter's words. I believe it was the presence of Jesus in Peter, working through Peter and through the other apostles gathered there. The resurrection had just happened and Jesus had been appearing to the apostles in different ways over a period of 40 days, we're told. It was a time of visions and miracles and the power of God working in ways that left a special sense of the holy over everything and everyone around. We've lost that over the years, that sense of the presence of Jesus around us and in us and in others, that sense of the holy. Jesus had just been there with them. They were still filled with his power, his spirit. Not long before, Jesus had assured his followers that he would be with them. He'd also told them that when they were helping and healing and serving others, they were really helping, healing, serving him. That he was still with them, present in the poor, present in the suffering, in the broken, present in everyone. We need to get back to that idea. Of course, that's easier said than done. Maybe this story will help. There was once a famous monastery which had fallen on very hard times. In days past, its many buildings had been filled with young monks and its big church resounded with singing and chanting. But now it was nearly deserted. People no longer came there to be nourished by prayer. A handful of old monks still shuffled through the halls and still praised their God, but with heavy hearts. Now on the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a little hut. He would come there from time to time to fast and to pray. No one ever spoke with him, but whenever he appeared, the word would be passed from one monk to another. The rabbi walks in the woods. And for as long as he was there, the monks would feel sustained by his prayerful presence. He seemed an especially wise and holy man. One day the abbot decided to visit the rabbi and to open his heart to him. So after morning Eucharist, he set out through the woods. As he approached the hut, the abbot saw the rabbi standing in the doorway, his arms outstretched in welcome. It was as though he had been waiting there for some time. The two embraced as though they were long-lost brothers. They read scripture together for a while and prayed together. The abbot told of the trouble that had befallen his beloved monastery, how there no longer seemed to be any life there, how their buildings were nearly abandoned now, how their community was dying. After the abbot was finished lamenting, all was quiet for a while. Finally, the rabbi lifted his head and said, You have come to ask a teaching of me. I will give you a teaching, but you may only repeat it once. After that, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot, and he gave this teaching. He said, The Messiah is among you. For a while, all was silent. Then the rabbi continued, saying, That is all. You may go home now. And the abbot left without a word. The next morning, the abbot called his monks together. He told them he had received a teaching from the rabbi who walks in the woods, and that this teaching was never again to be spoken aloud. Then he slowly looked at each of his brothers in turn and finally told them, The rabbi said that one of us is the Messiah. The monks were astounded. Are you sure? What could it mean? Is Brother John the Messiah or Father Matthew? Or Brother Thomas, am I the Messiah? What could this mean? They were all deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching, but no one ever mentioned it again. 
Though the teaching was never spoken aloud, it affected the monks deeply. They began to treat one another with a very special reverence. There was a special, kind-hearted, gentle quality about them now, which was hard to describe, but easy to notice. Occasional visitors found themselves deeply moved by this new quality they witnessed among the monks. Before long, people were coming from far and wide to be nourished by the spiritual life of the monks. They sensed something, something extraordinary was happening here, something holy. As time went on, they were once again a thriving, growing community of faith, and all because of that one teaching, the Messiah is among you. Would you believe such a teaching? If you could, how that teaching could change your life. We should try that. It would be easy to try. I'm not sure how easy it would be to believe, but it's definitely worth trying. There's an old benediction. Wherever you go, May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. That's a wonderful teaching, but it's really two very different teachings, seeing Christ in others and being Christ for others, seeing Jesus and being Jesus. We talk a lot about seeing Christ in those we meet. We are taught to look for Christ in the grieving, in the lonely, in the sick, in the poor. We are taught to see Christ in the people we meet day to day, in our neighbors, in our families, in the stranger. And we are taught to treat everyone we meet as though they were Christ himself. But that's still about seeing Jesus. What about being Jesus? Impossible? Yes, I suppose it is. But it is the calling that we accept when we seek to be disciples, call ourselves the people of God. Some of it is impossible, sure, but most of it is not. Jesus never asked us to heal anybody or drive out a demon. Listen to what Jesus asks of us in different places in Scripture. If you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Love one another. Judge not, lest ye be judged. When people are hungry, you yourselves give them something to eat. Whoever welcomes in my name one of these children welcomes me. Whoever wants to be first must place himself last of all and be the servant of all. Love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now some of those things are no doubt difficult, but impossible? No. And to prove it, in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus says this, Whoever believes in me will do what I do. Yes, they will even do greater things. Does that sound easy? Probably not. It will take some work, just like everything else that's worthwhile in this world. But I can't think of anything more rewarding. So let's work at it together, shall we? Who knows how many will be added to our number. May God be with us as we journey on. Amen.
I'm going to offer a prayer for the offerings that continue to come in in so many different ways. Let us pray. Bless these gifts, O God, as they are offered to you. We offer our gifts in many forms, including our love for you and for one another. Use our gifts, we pray, and use us. Help us to continue to find ways to share your love and to bring healing to your world. Through Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. And let's continue to offer prayers as I offer the pastoral prayers. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this Easter season, there is a hunger in us that links us to your wish for justice and guides us in struggling for right. There is a longing in us that links us to your desire that we should love one another and leads us to discover ways to share ourselves. There is a hunger in us that links us to your hope for wholeness and propels us into the newness you offer. Help us, God, to be servants of your peace as we learn how to care for one another in these strange times. Today we have special prayers for those who are in our hearts and minds. We pray for Dawn and Del, John and Stella, Len and Donna, Herb, Sharon, Ishbel, Ian, Ray, Helen, and John. We have prayers for Kay, for Maggie, for Lori, for Mickey, and Bill, and Roberta, and many others who are in our hearts and minds today. We also have special prayers for Elaine Elliott and her family, including Kevin and Caitlin, as they mourn the tragic death of Elaine's granddaughter, Chelsea. God, we pray for your healing, your compassion, and your loving care as they face this terrible loss. Hear our prayers, O God, and in your love, answer. For all of these that we have named and for all your children who need you, God, we ask your blessing and your healing touch. And now we pray together with the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's, God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to, to proclaim, proclaim Jesus, Jesus crucified and risen, and risen our judge and our hope in life in death in life beyond death god is with us we are not alone thanks be to god
As we end this service, may God be with you and bless each of you as you go into a world that demands your care and needs your love. May the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you this day and forevermore. Amen.